Hi, I'm Pam, and I would like to welcome you to the Live Authentically Show. My team and I help other people step into their authentic realities via a number of different modalities. This show is obviously one of them. We also have a Facebook group, and we can be found at liveauthentically.today slash FB. We would love to have you join us for a group of like-minded people committed to spiritual growth and transformation. I'm also super pumped that I have just released my first book. It's called SOAR, S-O-A-R, and it can be found on Amazon. It's available now in audiobook, paperback, and Kindle. It's a spiritual experiential journey through a transformative event in my life and shows how I partnered with the universe to create my new reality. I am also an individual spiritual life coach, so reach out to me if you would like to talk about launching your journey into authenticity. I am super pumped that on today's show with me, I have Steve Warner. Hi, Steve. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. How about yourself? I'm doing well. Thank you. Yeah. So Steve is um, from, he founded the Hour of Champions, and I'm super pumped to have you tell his story. Steve and I met through, I don't even know exactly how, we'll just, we called it Facebook magic, right? Just somehow we became Facebook friends and I just love, it's just such a testament to how when you put yourself out there in an authentic way, when you're just out there doing your thing, kind of shining your light in the world, the universe kind of magically puts the right people in our path. And that is why we're here. Just a couple of weeks ago, we met on Facebook. I had the pleasure of being on Steve's podcast a couple of days ago, and it's podcast swap week. So now Steve is on my show, and I'm delighted to have you here. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but before we launch into the interview today, I wanted to start with um, a little bit differently. This is obviously the anniversary of the events of 9-11, 19 years ago. And I wanted to take a few moments um, to just to sit in silence and just remember the victims of 9-11 and um, all of the lives that have been touched in some way, shape or form, their loved ones, their families, friends, people who have been touched indirectly and really everyone who was here to remember that day, um, you know, our lives were forever changed. So I would just like to start with a moment of silence. Thank you. And how absolutely fitting that Steve is here to talk to us about um, his story he is going to be talking to us about um, being a hero. And I love his story. I love what you're about, how fitting. You know, we heard that word a lot around the events of 9-11, the days that followed this, this idea of people who were stepping up to be heroes. And um, we all have the opportunity to be a hero in our own story. And that is precisely the energy that Steve embodies. And um, I can't wait for you to tell us your story. Thank you. I can't wait to share it. I've been kind of thinking, you know, I, I'm so passionate about it. And I, admittedly, I can get very long winded when telling my story. So I'm going to try to keep it as concise um, as possible. For sure. Um, and I'd love to hear whatever details you want to share. Um, but before we get into the details of your story, I always start my shows off with the same question for all of my guests. And that question is, what does it mean to you to live authentically every day? I love that question, and I told you that when um, when we were uh, on the Hour of Champions podcast, and I had the uh, the honor of hearing that you asked that on several um, interviews that I listened to, and so I thought about it, and I I remember telling you that what makes me authentic um, is that I really don't let people or myself get in my way. I practice, I should say, I practice very very rig rigidly to not let people or myself get in my way. I love that. And I'd love to dive in deeper on that. I love that phrase. And I think that that means something different to everyone. And I would love to hear you kind of color that in. I'd like to kind of dissect that and hear about what does it mean? What does it mean to not let yourself get in your own way? And also, what does it mean to not let others get in your way? What does that mean? Um, you know, what? Well, for myself, it's, it's letting my stories change the trajectory of my life. So in, my, uh, in the spirit of the Hour of Champions, the, the first thing that, I've, that I realized was that I wasn't living in reality. I was really great at making up stories 
that put me into a spot that didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. um, so not letting myself get in my way is doing a quick reality check. And if some event in my life is taking place that's sending me off course and I tell myself my life is falling apart, I have to quickly grab myself, take a deep breath, and uh, ask myself where's the evidence in that. And more often than not, there is one component or one spoke on the wheel that fell off, not the whole wheel. So um, if I let the whole wheel fall off, I'm in my way. I can't get out of my way. But if I understand that, you know, there's one thing that needs to be fixed, all of a sudden, the whole the trajectory of my life starts going back up again instead of all over the place. Um, letting other people get in my way uh, is, uh, I'll try to use a great example. Um, sometimes you deliver a message or I deliver a message to somebody and the way they receive it is not the way I intended it. Right. Might've been, you know, with my wife at the beginning of the week and we were having a conversation and she said, Oh my God, how could you say that to me? You know, about something. And I said, well, Oh my God, how could you receive it like that? Yeah. You received it with like in a condescending way. I was sending it with pure love, mm -hmm. you know? Now, if I let myself get all hung up for the next two days about being freaked out with the way she received my message, I let her get in my way, right? She received it, but I know how I delivered it. Right. Um, and as long as I know that, that person can't be in my way. Yeah, I love that. Great Thank example. You. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, so before we get into um, what you do on a daily basis to help people kind of reframe their story from the hero mindset, take us back in time and just sort of color in the, the events of your life, kind of the chronology that led you up to this point in your life. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, uh, I, I spent the first uh, 20 years of my business life as a commodity trader at the Chicago Board of Trade. And I had pretty much 20 years of uninterrupted success. It really wasn't even reality. Yeah. It was awesome. And, you know, I was able to generate a, an amazing income. It allowed me, to, uh, it gave me freedom. It gave me uh, the ability to travel, to live in a beautiful home with beautiful cars and, and do, you know, put my kids in the best schools and um, the best of everything. Uh, when that ended because of technology, I went into the real world and I had to reinvent myself. And I was thrown into some unenviable situations, one after the other, um, out of my control with family business and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I just, I, I kind of learned uh, life, life wasn't so, that flight wasn't so smooth anymore, turbulent at times. Uh -huh. uh, I wound up building an amazing business only to be crushed in 2009 by the credit crisis. Mm -hmm. And that kind of took me down to my knees. I don't like not succeeding or failing, though that a lot of that, most of that was out of my control. It's, it really, it really crushed me. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time I was battling uh, depressive thoughts, anxiety, stress, overwhelm. And I wound up getting on a series of medications, all prescribed by a doctor. Uh, I lived on those for a number of years, and the story that I spun at that time was I kind of introduced myself as Steve Warner, the victim. You should, you should feel sorry for me. I lost my business due to the credit crisis, and things really suck, and kind of dragged myself along, and that's what I portrayed, and other victims found their way into my life, and excuse my French found its way into my life, and my trajectory was going downward despite the fact that I had the beautiful wife, the great kids, the house, the cars, the everything. On the outside, it all looked perfect. And on the inside, it was really, it was crashing and burning. And I was living day to day on four different medications. And um, in 2015, I, was a, I intersected with a friend of mine's son, who's a doctor. We were both walking through downtown Chicago. We bumped into each other. And I've known the young man since he's 12 years old. That time, 37 years old, he's a doctor. And we said, let's get together and have breakfast and get caught up on life. Six o'clock in the morning in downtown Chicago. And he looked at me and he said, 
what are you on? And I said, what do you mean, what am I on? He said, you don't look right. And I got all defensive. I'm like, hey, man, it's 6 o'clock in the morning. Who else is able to get here at 6 o'clock in the morning? Right. And he's a very tough kid, tough doctor, tough coach, actually, also. And he said, uh, you don't look right. What's going on? And I said, well, you know, I had this business failure, and I've been on all these meds. And he said to me, tell me what you're taking. And I rattled off. I said, I'm an Ambien, Klonopin, Doxepin, and Lexapro. And he looked me square in the eye, and he said, you're going to die. And I'm like, oh, my God. It's 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm eating breakfast. I'll have a doctor tell me I'm going to die. And he said to me, I want you off all these medications. Um, I'm going to get you off everything. Are you in or are you out? And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is like a crazy movie. Now I have a life-changing decision to make split second. Yeah. You know, and as I explained to you uh, when we first met, like one doctor's telling me this is what I need to be on to survive. Another doctor's telling me if I don't get off of these, I'm going to die. And who do you trust more than your doctor, right? So I had to make a choice, and I said, okay, I'll do it. And he said, okay, you're willing to go all in? I said, yeah, I'm willing to go all in. He said, all right, give me Jill. That's my wife's phone number. I want to text her. I want you to go home and give her all your medicine. She's going to be giving it to you as I tell her to. You better find another room to sleep in because this is going to be really rough. Said, what do you mean really rough? He said, you're addicted. I said, addicted to what? I've never abused the prescription. It says take one in the morning and one at night. Yeah. And he said to me, the drugs that you just told me are highly addictive. And um, I'm just telling you, this is going to be very painful. So I came home. I gave my wife all the meds. And I could tell you night number two, it was February 5th, 2015. Uh, I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was shivering and crying. And I was going through massive withdrawals. Mm -hmm. And I texted him. I need more Klonopin. I could see the bubble of the text coming back. And it said, screw you. Not so nicely, by the way. Mm -hmm. And I texted back. I said, no, you don't understand. I'm melting down. And he said to me, the bubble came through again. It said, get in the street and run 25 wind sprints right now. And I called him. I said, Ari, it's February 5th. It's four below zero out. And he said, I know the date. I know the time. I have a wife and family. I'm up with you. Get in the street right now. Oh my gosh. I got my gym shorts on, a hoodie, gym shoes. I got in the street. I ran 25 wind sprints. Came back huffing and puffing. He said, how do you feel? I said, I actually feel better. And he said, all right, get in the shower, get cleaned up, make yourself breakfast, start reading. Let's go get the day started. And I, I go, but it's 2.47 in the morning. He goes, I know the date. I know the time. Let's go. That was the first night of 10 months of hell. Ten, okay. um, 10 months, one drug at a time. And um, it, it, it would come in waves. I would feel great for a while, and then, bam, I would just get hit with nausea, headaches, uh, fatigue, uh, incredibly lethargic. I would be sitting in a business meeting listening to people, and I'd have to excuse myself and go into a bathroom and throw up and come back and pretend – like I was okay, and I lived that way for, for 10 months. Um, during that time, I started going to the gym in the middle of the night, um, and I started uh, incorporating spirituality, which you are a master of, and I was a non-believer of, mm -hmm. to tell you the truth. That was the missing component in my life. I was always very into fitness, and, uh, and, and I thought I was a relatively tough guy, um, I didn't know what I had in store for me, but it was the spiritual component that was really missing. I would get up at three in the morning. I would find something spiritual, something on mindset, program it into my phone and head to the gym, which was open 24 seven. And I know I'm getting long winded here, but I'll conclude quickly. One night um, I was walking out of the gym at 4:15 in the morning and a guy was walking in and he said, man, I got to ask you a question. And I said, what's that? He said, I get here at 4.15. Like, you're leaving when I get here. What time do you get here? And I said, about 3, 3.15. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, saving my life. And he said, what do you mean? And I kind of explained to him what was going on. And he said, wow, it's like you're training for a championship fight. You do that all in an hour? And I got in my car in the dark, and I grabbed a business card. I'll never forget. I flipped it over, and I wrote down the hour of champions. 
And I said, I'm going to need this sometime because if I'm going through this, I have a pretty good idea that there's millions of people going through what I'm going through and I'm going to change the world when I get through this. And um, in October of that year, I woke up one day and something was strange. Like I felt good. I didn't even know what it felt like to feel good. And my wife came down and I had a tear coming down my face and she said, what's the matter? And I said, I feel good. Like <laughs> I'm scared, you know? And I called Ari, my doctor, and I said, Ari, this is goofy. I feel good. And he said, congratulations, you made it. And I started living my life that way. Um, that's how I've got here. So Amazing. Thank you for sharing that just so vulnerably and transparently. Um, just so much, so much there. Let's go back to the moment where you were talking with your friend, right? You just met him for coffee. It was supposed to be a light, nice, lighthearted catch up faced with a life changing decision. I really want to talk a little bit about intuition because that is such a big piece of spirituality with who we are and really tapping into what our gut is telling. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you arrived at that decision? Was it a gut based? Was it kind of a heart centered, soul based decision? You know, did you rely on your intuition in that moment? I know that especially in the world that you were living in, that world of, of numbers and corporate America and, you know, looking at numeric barometers for things, it's often hard to rely on our intuition, right? We're more conditioned to rely on logic and reason and facts and figures. But talk to me a little bit about how you started to tap into your intuition. What a, what a fantastic question. I, I have to, <laughs> I get emotional when I think about it, but, um, you know, I've, I've lived this way kind of my whole life. I've I've always said I like to do things that other people won't, you know. Um, I actually, in like 1999, I went to my first Anthony Robbins seminar, and I remember coming back to the Board of Trade where I worked, and a friend of mine said to me, why would you do that? And I just looked and said, because you wouldn't. You know, like, I like to explore. So I had this intuition. When, when somebody tells you you're going to die, um, it's one thing. When it's a doctor, it's another thing. And I also knew that the way I was living was, uh, though it was all under the care of a doctor and everything was prescribed and I never abused prescriptions, it, it seemed kind of reckless to me. Like my life was racing to bed at night, taking four medications so I could check out from the world. The great irony is I never had a fear of dying. I had a fear of living at that time. And I didn't want to have a fear of living anymore. I had kids and a supportive wife and this amazing nucleus of a family. And I remember my youngest would come into the bedroom at night after I took these meds and I was like going into the twilight zone mm -hmm. and I could see the fright in his face. You know, I could literally see the fright and the, um, my intuition at that time said to me, I have to get my family out of this pain of watching me live in fear. You know, what I was doing to them was, it didn't hurt me at all. It hurt me that it was hurting them, you know, and, and, I, I, and I could sense it. And I just knew that, um, that, that intersection of, of, of us the previous week downtown, something was kind of preordained, if you want to say, or preplanned. Absolutely. Yeah. It was time. It was yeah. just time. Right. I believe that the universe will strategically put the right people and experiences in our path precisely at the moment that we need it. So the universe was sending him as a messenger, right? As a messenger, a wake up call, a it's time to change. It's time to make a shift. Um, that's not even a guess. That's like to me and my world. And I know for sure in your world, that's just a fact, right? Absolutely. And, and yeah. a lot of people struggle with that fact, but it makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> you know, it was a gift. It's like, here you go. You know, well, you lived in all this pain and now it's time to end it. So you don't know how to do it yourself. So here's how we're going to do it. Yeah, I love that. So powerful. Thank you. Those 20 years of uninterrupted success. Um, you described it as, you know, you had the, the flashy cars and all the shiny object and everything looked great from the outside. And to the outside world, you probably, people probably looked at you and said, he has it all. But what did you feel? What were you feeling on the inside? Can you talk to me a little bit about um, maybe any disconnects that you were feeling or, you know, was something missing? I think but because my wife and I both come from broken families, 
that I always had this fear, <clears throat> you know, of, of, of something falling apart. And I, I was always racing in my 20s and 30s to be 65 so I could know that I won the game, if that makes sense, you know. So um, despite the fact that, yeah, it, it, was, it was financial Hollywood, you know, it was, a, it was an amazing place to be. It gave me uh, more than I could ever ask for. I always respected the time. I never lived recklessly. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I was very, very conscious about the nucleus of a family that I had created and my responsibility for all of that. So um, the 20 years in business that was uninterrupted is like unprecedented. Nobody gets that. That's like unheard of. You know, it was a gift. Um, and, I, and I was very thankful for it, honestly. And when it ended, um, it ended because of technology. I, I didn't live in resentment that my life was taken away from me. I lived in, honestly, in gratitude that it was just a 20-year gift. Like, who gets that? And now I'm on to the next phase of life. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. Thank you. Um, I would love to talk a little bit about the, the feelings that you were experiencing as you contemplated moving into healing, because I think that so many people, and again, it's, it's an observation, not a judgment, you know, are pulled to comfort and famil familiarity, even if that means a life of negativity and unhappiness, you know, that's what they're used to, right? That's what, that's their comfort zone. That's what they know. And it's scary. It's scary to make a shift, kind of that paradigm shift. So what were some of the, you know, what were some of the things that you experienced as you, you know, as you contemplated? I know it was a, for you, it was a pretty split second decision, but I know for a lot of people, they're kind of on that, you know, kind of at that proverbial fork in the road, right? Do I continue to stay on this path that I've been on and just stay in autopilot and kind of go through the motions? Everything is more or less kind of sort of okay, I think, or, but I just know that internally something isn't right. I'm contemplating healing. So what can you say? What words of confirmation, affirmation, wisdom, encouragement can you give people right now who are kind of at that proverbial fork in the road and contemplating going down the path of healing? I'm so happy you asked this also. It's such a great question, and it's so um, important at this particular time in history. My best way of always um, answering is through a story, so if you don't mind, I'll share it in a story. My doctor friend Ari said to me, you're going to have to get spiritual. And I said, well, how do you do that? You know, and he said to me, there's plenty of ways to fit. I'm not going to tell you because I don't know what spiritual means to you versus what it means to me. So go find it. I go, go find it. What do I do? Google it. He goes, that'd be a good start. You know, so I Googled it and it was suggested to me to go to a spiritual meeting of sorts. It was almost like a recovery meeting for addicts and, uh, and I was reluctant because I was this, you know, high achiever and I'm not an addict. And truly, I, I, you know, I was addicted to prescribed meds. So in real reality, I was kind of an addict. So I went to this meeting very reluctantly. It was in the town next door. Met at 530 in the morning. It was in a blizzard. I'll never forget. And I, I, I drove about 20 minutes and I get out of my car and the snow is just piling up on my jacket and I can't find this address and I'm bitching and moaning at the world, you know? And finally I see this address and I see this little narrow stairway and I walk up and I go into a room and there's about 30 people sitting on couches and chairs and they're from all walks of life, like literally, like, you know, financial people, school teachers, few homeless people, and they're sitting around in a circle and they all have this big book in their lap and um the moderator looked at me and he said, welcome. And I said, thanks. You know, like I'm, okay, I'm here now what? He said, why don't you have a seat? And what's your name? And I tell him, he said, okay, Steve, here's what we do. We all go around the room and we read a little excerpt out of this book and then we comment on it. Are you cool with that? And I said, yeah, let's go. Come on, I'm cool with it. <laughs> and gets to me and uh, I said, before I read um, my excerpt, can I ask one question? And the guy goes, sure. And he said, um, I, I said, how do I know all you people aren't full of crap? And he looks and he goes, what? I go, you over there, you have God, you have the universe, you have your higher power. I go, 
how do I know when I leave here today, this place just doesn't fold down and it's like some big con, like the movie The Sting from years ago. And there was an old man sitting next to me on the couch. And he looked at me and he said, son, why don't you just give what we do a try? And if it doesn't work, we'll just refund your misery. I'm like, oh my God, who knew to put that guy next to me? I go, this has to be real. You know, and that was like my eye opener. And they gave me the book. I took it home and I threw it on my closet shelf. I never looked at it. Several weeks later, I was searching for spirituality and I stumbled upon Marianne Williamson. And all she was talking about was this book called The Course in Miracles, A Course in Miracles. And I go, no way. I go over to my closet. I get on a chair. I grab the book. Um, it's A Course in Miracles. It was given to me earlier. I just wasn't ready for it. The message, I know that was, again, long, but the message is the spiritual piece is the missing, is the missing piece when you're, when you're disconnected. When you are disconnected from your spirit, um, you're off course. And when you get on that course, the universe just opens up. Yeah, I love, I love, love, love that you said that because I know that so many people are in those, are in that situation. I mean, I know I was on that trajectory. You know, I was, you know, in my 20s working in corporate America, long hours consulting actuary. You know, had I stayed working, I would have, I would continue to rise the ranks through you know, corporate headquarters, whatever, all of that. Um, but I decided to stay home, become a full-time mom. And, you know, I had a huge, huge loss in my life, in my early 30s that caused me to explore my spirituality. And I think we know we all have those. We all have those heart awakening catalysts, those moments in our lives that really prompt us to deep, you know, to dig deep and to go within and, you know, connecting with ourselves, with the universe, with God, higher power, whatever you want to call it is really is your only option at that point. Because, you know, we all have our, you know, our, you know, symbolic, you know, rock bottoms, right? We all have our own individual rock bottoms. And the only way out, I'm so convinced that the only way out is through a spiritual path, you know, spiritual, religious, whatever it is, it's, but it's just reaching for something more than who we are, more than what we can see and experience in our physical world. And I know that for some people that can be really daunting because it's, again, it's not a formulaic approach. It isn't this 10 step program, you know, follow the steps and then you'll come out on the other side. It is very much a process of self-discovery. It's a process of trial and error. It's a process of, it's an individual process. And there is no one blueprint that works for everyone. This isn't a cookie cutter approach. So what type of advice can you give people who are contemplating exploring spirituality? Again, it's nebulous. It's these metaphysical woo-woo concepts. You know, how do you grasp something? How do you go start to embark on something and embrace something that you can't, that isn't tangible? So maybe you can give people some just, you know, early, you know, early steps that they could start to take to explore their spirituality. Yeah, I think, you know, there's this, there's this confusion, right, between uh, religion and spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, so when I talk to people and they say to me, I'm religious, it's, it's, it's just not, you know, I go to church, I go to synagogue, yada, yada. I've been doing it for years. I've been doing it for, since I was uh, a kid. I, it, it just doesn't work. And um, I, I often say, well, I don't, I don't think that you're um, cognizant of the difference between religion and spirituality. And then, of course, they get defensive and they go, what's the difference? And I say, well, in the world that I come from, Religious people are trying to stay out of hell. Spiritual people have already been there. So if you've been in hell, you're spiritual and you didn't even know it, right? And that, that's getting them into reality real quickly. You know, that opens up their mind and now they're willing, they're going, oh boy, he's right, now what? So if you've been in hell, and hell comes in so many different shapes, sizes, forms, ages, times in life, but if you've been there, um, it's, uh, I think the greatest thing for me was to just, I started uh, tapping into YouTube and just putting in different combinations of words on spirituality. And I stumbled upon the likes of, and I know you and I talked about this, Gabrielle Bernstein, Wayne Dyer, uh, Marianne Williamson. And I just started listening and they were all telling my story. Mm -hmm. it, 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 <laughs> I'm like, who, who told them to tell me this, you know? And it just became, it 
my shoulders went like this. Phew. Finally, I get it. You know, it's okay to, and I, I think you and I have shared this word also, to surrender. I think that uh, exploring any path, whether it's in a book, a lecture, a YouTube video, to spirituality is, is just, it's freedom. <laughs> right. Well said. And that's, I would absolutely echo everything you said. Um, it really is a lifestyle. You know, it's, um, it's deeply rooted in freedom and it's a lifestyle really that prioritizes connection. You know, that is the piece that's, that's missing. You know, you mentioned feeling, you know, in those 20 years of success, feeling disconnected, right? And that disconnection is what prompted you to kind of discover, kind of go down this spiritual path. And, and that's what spirituality is. Again, it's about connection. And I, I describe it as a process whereby we craft our own belief system based on our own life experiences as compared to religion. And again, it's not a judgment. You know, I respect all different walks of life, all different belief systems. But when people ask me the difference, that's what I say. You know, religion is, is inheriting other people's beliefs that have been developed from their life experiences. Well, I'm having my own life experience. You're having your own life experience. And that's where the joy, the joy really is in the journey, the journey of discovering and the journey of, of really figuring out how our life experiences are meant to mold us and shape us and help launch us into our purpose, you know, which gets into much deeper questions like, why are we here, right? Why are we here on this earth? And I, I love that we're talking about, you know, the 20 years of success kind of being caught up in that rat race because so many people get caught up in that. I mean, I was already going down that trajectory of not really, you know, not digging deep and asking those questions, but we're really here for more than just to work and amass personal possessions and, you know, to go on vacations and, you know, yeah, fun and recreation, that's all part of it. But we get so caught up in just the materialism, the stuff. And that's because we're conditioned to live from the ego. Again, not a judgment, but the ego is concerned with matters of the physical world. And the soul is concerned with things like you've spoke of, you know, connection and, you know, truth, peace, all of those things are our soul-based initiatives. So I'm really glad that you shared that. Thank you. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. I think it's, you know, for people that are resistant like I was, you know, um, it's, and I'm, I'm sure you're fantastic at this in your practice, it's getting people to a point of curiosity. Like, what if, you know, what if Pam's right? <laughs> you know, like, like I'm in pain right now. What if she's right? You know, because I think inherently when we tell people what to do, they're, they don't own it. You know, we know that when we get them curious and let them come back and tell us the next week, my God, I kind of listened to what you said and I went and did this and I went and did this and I could see this little ray of light coming in. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's super powerful. Yeah. And brilliant words of advice too, from your friend, you know, go find it, go figure it out. Yeah. Right? That's really, that is the process. I mean, it's very much an individual process of self-discovery. And so, you know, people who are spiritual teachers, you know, mentors, you know, they're, the best ones are the ones that help you find, help you guide you to your own answers. The ones who say, you know what, they kind of just nudge you off the edge of the diving board and say, okay, now you're in the deep end, figure it out, swim to the side. And you do, right? I mean, that's the, the joy really is in the journey in all of the discovering and the figuring out along the way. So brilliant, brilliant words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit more about um, your podcast and what you do on a daily basis to help people make that shift, that, make that shift from the victim mentality to hero, from fear to faith and surrender. So let's, let's talk more about, about that. Sure. So in 2018, I woke up one day and I said, um, you know, I've got I, I to find a way to share my story. And I reached out to one of my best college friends who uh, was living down in Charlotte. North Carolina, and I said, I'm going to start a Facebook group called The Hour of Champions based upon my journey because I have this belief. And I had been coaching people in um, entrepreneurship and in business for several years, but I wanted to make a shift. And I, I believe that, you know, um, I had the formula, and it's, it's no like magical secret to, um, to freedom in life. And that was through um, intense fitness. Uh, mindset training and spirituality incorporated into an hour every single morning. It worked for me, and I don't like to see people in pain. 
So I said, I called up my friend. I said, I'm going to share my story on Facebook. And I know it might sound a little egomaniacal, but I, I have to do it. Like I'm being called to do it. And I'm going to start a Facebook group. Will you be my first member? And he said, I'll be incredibly proud to be your first member. And I think you need to share that story. So we started a group and we called it the Hour of Champions. And we started inviting friends in and I started exploring, you know, learning how to do Facebook lives. And I built a coaching program, um, a six week coaching program about with two sides to it. I know you, I, I told you earlier that I've been up since four o'clock in the morning and that's my daily routine. I wake up every single morning, have a prayer session while lying on my back in my bed. That's my authentic way to, to, to you know, uh, pray uh, to the universe. Uh, and then I immediately get up. I look for something on mindset that I'm going to program into my phone and I'm off to my fitness every single day. And we started, um, started a group and it just started kind of snowballing. And this morning there's close to 4,000 people on there. And it's all by just people telling people, telling people. And I believe in strength and community. Um, I want it. I have this crazy, um, um, it's not a belief. It's a, it's a crazy desire to affect a million lives through what I do. Um, and people started just joining and using it as an open forum to share, to share their struggles and to help somebody else on any given day. Um, so on any given day, I'm doing Facebook Lives, posting um, uh, Warnerisms, we call them, quotes that I've made up. I try not to inspire. I, I, I still believe that inspiration minus transformation equals nothing. So um, I'm all about transformation, you know, and I encourage, you know, people to invite people and to just be open and share. It's like a safe space where people can come to the forefront with their truth. Uh, so we've created a, uh, a coaching program around that, a six-week coaching program based on principles that I, um, that I uh, live by, um, the mind, body, and spirit piece, and then um, certainly the reality part that I, I told you about earlier, and then six other components. Anybody that's interested can, uh, can jump on my website, hourofchampions.com, and it's there to read about, to learn about. Um, and then we got, you know, it just got into the podcast mode. I, I, uh, I was blessed to have you on it the other day. And I knew that you had this great victim to hero story. And I live by this mantra that you wake up every single day and you audition for a role in your own life. Every day your feet hit the floor and you either win the role of the victim of your life or the hero of your life, uh, based on the story that you're telling yourself that morning. And whichever story you choose to spin is the way your world is going to wind up, right? If you walk into your bathroom to brush your teeth as the victim that day, I can tell you you're going to be resentful, fearful, angry. Um, other, your phone's going to ring in about an hour from another victim that's going to find their way into your life. But conversely, if you can spin that story, if you can find the hero in that story, and the hero exists somewhere, it's often hiding, and that's what we're great at, is helping people find the hero in that miserable story. And you can spin, and when I talk about heroes, I'm not talking about people that dive on grenades or save people from burning buildings. I'm talking about your personal hero, the person that you're proud of for who you are. Um, your whole world, your trajectory changes. Um, the universe opens up, opportunities knock at your door. Other heroes find their way into your life. Um, and I believe that the missing link between the two, and I know I told you this the other day, was courage. We disconnect from our courage for some reason, and we start spinning that victim story, everything falls apart. So when we find ourselves there, we have to in, in, innately find a way to reclaim courage, and that's by understanding our story what we've done in the past, how we've gotten through crisis or critical situations and start spinning that or painting that picture. And it's, it's so doable. It's crazy. But we love, for some reason, it's being a victim is a very safe place to be. You don't have to do much. You get to feel sorry for yourself. 
You get to expect other people to feel sorry for you. Convince yourself you're not capable of much, you know. Um, and uh, uh, getting to the hero is tough, but it's it's a work every single day. It, it doesn't end because we're we're being thrown. Life is full of curveballs and things. Four hours from now, we have no idea about the call we might get that might send us into a spin. So I hope that answered that. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, you know, energetically speaking, all of the things that you spoke about in terms of the victim mentality, just those lower vibrational emotions, you know, we be, may become angry or resentful or fearful or doubtful, whatever it is, all of those energies associated with victims, those are very low vibrational energies. And the work really is, um, there's, there's a lot of work to get from that place to the higher vibrational energies that, um, that are soul-based. But everything we want can only be achieved through those higher vibrational energies, you know, love, peace, forgiveness, acceptance, all of that, you know, those are all at high vibrational energies. So we've really, again, the answer is courage. That really is the missing link. That is the key that unlocks the door that allows us to open ourselves up, step into this world of amazingness. And then when we are at those high vibrational places, we attract better. I mean, what happens, what shows up in our reality, I mean, it's almost like feeling, it feels magical, right? There's an ease, there's a flow, there's an organicness. And the universe, law of vibration, will see it, that, see it happen no other way. It will automatically match us with people of similar vibrations. So like you said, you just keep getting more of the same. If you're in that victim mindset, you keep getting more of the same. But the same happens when you're in that place of the hero, those high vibrational energies, that's what the universe just keeps sending your way. And it is absolutely amazing to be in that place. So I'm delighted that you, so happy for you, delighted that you were able to share your story with me and all of our listeners and viewers today. Again, I know you mentioned this earlier, but if you could just repeat where people can get in contact with you, if they would like to talk to you directly. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, and I, I really want to add this in at the end that the, the most fascinating part of my story is that I had myself convinced that I was depressed. Mm -hmm. And when I got to the other side and I finally had the courage to ask Ari, my doctor, what he saw that morning, he saw a man that was heavily consumed with fear that didn't have coping mechanisms. And I said, no, I, I was depressed. And he said, no, I don't think so. I think you had fear, but your doctor didn't know how to treat fear, so he treated depression. So I hope that stimulates some curiosity to people that might be listening, because depression masquerades, fear masks, masquerades around as a lot of other things. You know, one is an illness, one is a mindset. Right. I can be found at hourofchampions.com, H O U R O F C H A M P I O N S dot com. And anybody is welcome to join our Facebook group. It's a closed group, but um, anybody that uh, asks for an invite uh, fills out a few questions. I'd love to have a million people and people just helping people. I love that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you being here today. And to all of our viewers and listeners, thank you. I believe that time is a choice, and I'm grateful that you have carved time out of your day to be here and to listen to all of the wisdom that Steve has shared with us today. So again, I'd love to have you join my Facebook group. It is liveauthentically.today slash FB. Check out a copy of my book, Soar, next time you're on Amazon, and reach out to me if you would like to hear more about my individual coaching. So thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Mm -hmm.